Good afternoon and happy Friday. Welcome to part three of UHY's construction webinar series. My name is Susan Orr and I'm a partner in the Attest practice. Today we bring you the nuts and bolts of accounting and tax provisions as it relates to recent events and the construction industry. We have 60 minutes slated for today's event. 45 minutes for our presentation, and we have up to 15 minutes for Q&A. As a reminder, you can see us, but we can't see you, and everyone has been muted. I ask that you submit your questions in, via the toolbar. Simply expand the question section and type in your question and hit send. We will address those questions at the end of the program. You will receive a survey after today's presentation. We ask that you take a minute to fill it out and let us know how we did, and if there's anything we can do to help you and your business succeed. You are fortunate to hear from my esteemed colleagues today. John and Bob love this stuff and are masters in their craft. They are key resources at UHY for both the professionals and our clients. John Gallo is a tax principal from our Great Lakes region and leads UHY's national construction practice. He has spent 25 years at UHY entrenched in the construction industry and brings his clients value-add tax planning strategies based on his specialized and extensive tax knowledge. John participates in the Michigan Infrastructure Transportation Association and the AGC of Michigan on the Tax and Fiscal Affairs Committee. He will be presenting tax highlights of key provisions that will help you plan for your 2020 taxes. Bob Schrell is an ATTEST partner and the ATTEST leader of our Midwest region. He has been a leader in the Midwest region's construction practice for decades, plus spent five years as the CFO of a construction company. He is a reviewer of the annual AICPA Audit and Accounting Guide for Construction Contractors and a frequent contributor of construction accounting and related information to the Missouri chapters of AGC and American Subcontractors Association. Bob will be highlighting recent accounting standards that will likely impact your 2020 financial statements or certainly will so in the near future. Bob, let's get started and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Susan. So uh, my topics for today are uh, basically three. The first is uh, accounting for PPP loans and other related issues. Some uh, observations that we have from uh, adopting the new lease standards for contractors. And then uh, we still have on the horizon the new lease accounting standard. So uh, on to the PPP loan program. So the payroll protection program was a $669 billion business loan program that was established uh, by Congress to call the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act or the CARES Act. And it was uh, intended to help small businesses uh, keep their employees and uh, stay in business so that when uh, coronavirus was over, they'd still be around to continue and hire people. Um, Many of the contractors here in the audience may have a PPP loan. So um, as many of you might have a loan, uh, you might not be aware that there is more than one accounting model that you could use to account for the loan. And you might be thinking, well, you know, I signed a loan document, so isn't it a loan? Well, maybe not. Uh, after all, when Congress passed the CARES Act, uh, what they wanted to do was keep employees working and business open by giving the businesses forgivable loans. So if you were, a, uh, for example, a not-for-profit, that would sound an awful lot like a government grant. Well, the, the truth is that uh, PPP loan accounting is new and the Financial Accounting Standards Board never really contemplated uh, accounting for such an animal. And uh, so when there is no authoritative guidance, uh, you're able to analogize to other GAAP or other countries GAAP even. So there's basically three models that have been identified uh, that can be used for PPP loans. Uh, there's obviously the, the debt model. Uh, you could also account for it as a contingency. And then there's a not-for-profit model, which is under uh, topic 958. And then uh, lastly, uh, you could actually use international accounting standards, which is uh, government grants. So how do these models differ? Well, the debt and the contingency model basically uh, you recognize the loan as income when it's forgiven. Uh, 
um, the uh, grant model and the uh, international model it basically account for it as an in-substance grant. Um, you recognize the income as the expenses are spent. Um, and so you say, well, what, you know, what's the risk here if I were to do that? That sounds, sounds right. Well, the, the issue is, is that the forgiveness must be probable and that's a pretty high hurdle. And you can only recognize forgiveness to the extent that the requirements of the loan program have been met. So if it turns out that later you were incorrect and, uh, you should you know you weren't forgiven by the amount that you thought you were uh you would have the risk of a restatement of your financial statements that's something that you, you might want to avoid so in the next slide here um they eased the probability requirements congress did a little bit when they passed the following legislation which is the uh, payroll program flexibility act um, so this basically extends the qualifying expense period from eight to 24 weeks, it reduces the amount that you need to spend for payroll, um, and it extends uh, the maturity date if you aren't forgiven. And then uh, two significant issues is that it gives you a 10 month window to apply for forgiveness. And then the SBA has up to 150 days uh, to uh, decide whether or not they're gonna forgive the loan. So the, the two main effects of this is that it's likely that the forgiveness will occur uh, in a period different than the expenses are spent. So, you know, you'll expend the money in 2020, but you may not even apply for forgiveness until 2021. That makes it what we call a type two subsequent event for 2020. And uh, as a type two subsequent event, you're not allowed to uh, recognize that revenue in 2020 if you were under uh, the uh, debt or the contingency model. You'd have to wait till 2021 when you actually got uh, the forgiveness. So on the next slide, we we'll talk about uh, even though you know other options are available for most companies that I've worked with um, so far, they've been uh, following the debt model. So we'll kind of go through how that works. So when you obtain the loan, you record the loan as a financial liability in accordance with uh, Section uh, 470, which is the section in the accounting standards on debt, and you accrue interest under the interest method. Um, so basically from the date that you enter into the loan, you start accruing interest and you use uh, the rate that's uh, included in the loan. Uh, in other accounting standards, uh, they say that if a loan is a, uh, different than a market rate that you need to use a higher rate, but um, because this is a government loan, you are able to use that lower rate. So that um, you continue to record those uh, proceeds as a financial liability until the loan is either in whole or in part forgiven and the debtor, you know, or you pay off the loan. So the part that's forgiven, you are able to recognize as a revenue, other income, and the part that isn't, you continue to record interest on and you pay the uh, debt off. Um, so when, when do you recognize that forgiveness? Well, you, you're only able to recognize that forgiveness when the loan itself is actually forgiven. And that's when the SBA, uh, either provides notice or actually pays off uh, the loan with your uh, debtor. Um, so again, uh, by using this model, it's entirely possible that the loan will be forgiven in a period different than the period uh, that the expenses were incurred. So you'll have kind of a mismatching of expenses. So in the next slide, we talk about um, a couple of other ways that you could account for those loans. And the first two would perhaps allow more of a matching of the expense and the revenue. First one we have on the slide there is the international accounting standards. In that case, you recognize the cash inflow from the PPP loan as it uh, comes to you as a deferred liability, and then you derecognize it, um, you offset uh, to earnings as the cost for which the loan uh, you know, it was incurred for are being paid. Um, under the grant model, that uh, ASC topic 958 model, the cash inflows are recognized as a refundable deposit, and then you reduce that refundable advance and recognize the contributions once the conditions of the release have been substantially met or explicitly waived. And then the last model is the contingency model, and that, that basically says that you recognize the PPP loan as a liability, and when the grant proceeds become realized um, and released, uh, then you recognize that into earnings. 
So the major provision for both the international and the not-for-profit model is that uh, the release you know, must be uh, substantially met. To determine that, you might have to look at uh, the most restrictive covenants that are involved in the loan. So that might be headcount, or um, for some, it actually might be the need, the financial need requirement to begin with. Um, you can't use these conditions uh, if they are going to be met after your balance sheet date. So you have to make sure that uh, you'll meet them when you record the forgiveness in the period uh, that you recorded. So on the next slide, we kind of go through an illustration of how not having met the forgiveness restrictions at the balance sheet date could limit the amount of forgiveness recognized. So in this case, you know, the company received a million dollar loan and it elected the eight week qualifying expense period as of June 30th. Um, it's six weeks into its qualifying expense period. It's incurred $500,000 worth of qualifying expenses, but it knows that it won't meet the headcount exemption. So 25% of the loan uh, won't be uh, eligible for being forgiveness, forgiven. So um, when you record that forgiveness as of June 30th, you're only allowed to record 75% uh, of the forgiveness or the $375,000. So moving on, um, we talk about, in, so in, in, in my view, really the one of the, maybe the hardest uh, substantial, substantially met criteria just might be the loan criteria that was supposedly met when the application was filed. And that was, does the contractor meet the substantial need criteria? And I guess the government must be wondering that as well because they came up with a new form that you need to file if you have a loan of over two million dollars and that's uh, form 3509 um, and that that form addresses a couple of things first it addresses the business activity assessment it asks questions about you know how did the covid restrictions uh, impact your business but it also asks a bunch of uh, liquidity assessments uh, questions questions like you know, how much cash did you have before the loan uh, did you make any distributions after you got the loan? Uh, did you prepay any other debt after you got the loan? Did you pay anybody over $250,000 annually? Um, and what was the book value of your company? Um, so for those of you that, that took out loans, you'll note that none of those questions really were asked when you uh, signed the certification that said that you had financial need. They've all been subsequently added. Um, we don't really know what the SBA is going to, to do with those questions, but presumably that's going to be the, at least the start for their assessment of financial need. So, you know, what support do you need to have for these representations? Well, a lot of these questions actually require you to uh, provide support, like the cash uh, balance. You're supposed to attach, you know, support for that. Um, and I, I think even though this only is a requirement for contractors, that uh, have loans in excess of $2 million, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea for all contractors with PPP loans to complete, but not file, obviously, this, this, this form, uh, just to make sure that they've accumulated all the information that the SBA might want, just in case they come back and ask for it. So, so other documentation that you uh, probably should consider uh, retaining uh, on the next slide here is, uh, all records relating to the PPP loan, um, including those that you submitted with the loan application, and those that uh, support your uh, certification as to the necessity of the loan request and your eligibility for the PPP loan. And so um, what I'm recommending, I think what we're as a firm recommending is that, you know, if you did not actually go through a robust assessment of financial need when you completed the loan application, uh, probably is a good idea to do that now. And basically you would wanna uh, assess, you know, what did you know as of the date that you signed that agreement? What were, you, you know, how were you forecasting out your cash flows? What were your fears in terms of, uh, you know, how your business would evaporate at that time? And then, uh, you know, what capital did you have available? What loans could you borrow on? And, and then if you borrowed on those loans, you know, uh, what, could potentially have happened in terms of you know debt covenant requirements and things like that, and is it possible that those amounts actually wouldn't have been available? Um, some other information that you probably ought to make sure that you uh, 
retain is all the information that you're using to support your forgiveness application and anything that you're using to demonstrate your uh, compliance with the PPP requirements. Um, so you, 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 know, you might be saying to yourself, well, once my loan is forgiven, why do I need all this stuff? Um, well, that's because the SBA, you know, they can come back at any time over the next six years and reassess their forgiveness decision. They retain the right to come back in and, and audit you. And so, uh, you know, who knows what the SBA's view on uh, need or any of these other uh, attributes is going to be in the future. Uh, it's best to make sure that you have the documentation to support your uh, loan uh, saved. All right. So that uh, basically concludes uh, my remarks on the uh, PPP loan provisions. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, and I won't spend much time on this because I think probably most companies are already through it, but that's the new revenue recognition standards for contractors. Um, and basically just talk about a couple of the things that we worked through as we were uh, implementing it with uh, our contractors on this calendar year end. Uh, you know, the five-step model and the first step is identifying uh, the contract. Uh, some of the issues that came up uh, sometimes with contractors is uh, combining contracts. You know, if there were two contracts, do you account for the two as separate contracts or one, particularly in the area of uh, design build type contracts? And then change orders. Um, when should the change order be recognized? So at times under this uh, new uh, 606 model, uh, those actually would uh, sometimes get recognized a little earlier than uh, the legacy gap would have allowed. Um, and then also, uh, is the change uh, really a modification to the existing contract or is it you know, a different contract? And uh, that's an assessment that needs to be made on those change orders. The second step is identifying the performance obligation, and that's basically, you know, are there more performance obligations than just one, or is it just, you know, I'm building a building, or is it I'm designing the building, and then I'm building the building, two separate performance obligations. Criteria there is, is it capable of being distinct, or is it interrelated? Uh, next step is determining the transaction price. And there's a couple of intricacies for contractors that uh, you need to work through. And the first would be awards or contractor performance incentives or penalties. Um, and you, you're allowed to take, uh, or you're, you're required to take in terms of penalties, those into account in the uh, initial uh, estimation of the total revenue you receive on that contract uh, at the beginning of the contract. If you have a history of, of performing well and earning the incentives and you're allowed to recognize that revenue over the course of the contract. Uh, on the flip side, uh, if the contract is such that it's likely that uh, you're going to be penalized for not completing it in time, then you should recognize that as well. And the criteria is that you take into uh, account the profit uh, that is probable and that uh, for which a significant reversal in revenue will not occur. Again, it's a matter of judgment. Uh, the same with claims, you know, those are included in revenue if it's probable that a significant reversal won't occur. Uh, the next um, uh, step in the uh, process is to allocate the transaction price to the separate performance obligations, and that is done based on a standalone selling price. So most of the contractors that I've worked with uh, have only ended up with one performance contract per contract, so that has not uh, typically been a significant issue. And then you recognize revenue, and you recognize that uh, generally following a cost-to-cost -cost method, which looks you know, a whole lot to me like the old percentage of completion method. Um, so uh, the one item, uh, if, if you didn't by chance adopt uh, 606, you didn't have your uh, financial statements out uh, by uh, June or so of 2020, or your year end was after December 31st, uh, the FASB came out with ASU 202005, which gives you an extra year to implement, and that's uh, taking into account the coronavirus and the impact that it's had on business uh, in general. Um, so uh, quickly, uh, kind of go through this uh, new lease standard. Um, and, and I guess first thing I'd say is it's not really very new. Uh, it was issued in February of 2016. Um, but it uh, still hasn't uh, been adopted for uh, private companies. So if you're a public company, it was effective for years beginning after December 15th, 2018, 
And so they've already adopted it. Uh, private companies uh, were going to adopt it uh, basically this year, but again, because of the coronavirus, uh, that's been extended and um, the, the FASB didn't want companies to have to adopt two new standards of such magnitude in the same year. So they actually gave you an extra year on the corona or on the uh, lease standard. But anyway, sooner or later, you will have to adopt the lease standard. So let's uh, quickly go through the differences between the two methods. And I'll focus here uh, on the lessee accounting. Some, some of you might also have a, a leasing company and uh, the other information would be uh, relevant. But comparison of the old and new standard for the lease lessee is, um, you know, under the legacy gap, which was the old Section 840, uh, leases were either operating, which were completely off the balance sheet, or capital, which were in effect uh, the same as kind of like a time purchase. You know, they have the liability and you record the asset. Under the new model, all leases end up uh, being recorded on the balance sheet except for short term. And those short term leases are leases that are less than a year. And then there's uh, a different income statement pres presentation depending upon if it's an operating or a financing lease. So, you know, what's an operating lease and what's a financing lease? Generally, uh, Pretty much the same as it was before uh, in terms of that criteria. So what does that look like on the balance sheet? Well, um, you're going to end up with a non-current asset that's called either a financing or operating right of use asset and uh, you're going to end up with a liability that's going to be separated between current and non-current and it's either going to be a finance lease liability or an operating lease liability and you would you would present those separately, or if you didn't present them separately on the balance sheet, then you'd need to uh, separately disclose those uh, in the footnotes. So how does that impact the income statement? Well, on the income statement, uh, the financing lease ends up being interest and amortization expense, and they're presented as a separate lines. So the interest would be on the debt, um, and you know if the debt is larger at the beginning of the lease and so the interest expense would be larger at the beginning of the lease and you have less uh, principal payments more interest expense the amortization would be on a straight line basis through the course of the, uh, the period that the lease is, is in uh, for on the operating lease you end up recognizing only a, a single lease expense and that um, is basically the interest expense that you would recognize under the financing lease and then the amortization of the right to use asset is such that it uh, equals um, a straight line expense over the course of the lease for both the combining the interest and the amortization um, so that's you know different it ends up actually pretty much equaling the rent payment on the cash flow statement the um, Financing lease, you're going to have an operating activity for interest and you're going to have financing activities for the principal. On the operating lease, it's just going to be uh, operating activities. So, um, you know, some business implications that you have to watch out for is, um, you know, many of you have uh, loan agreements and many of those loan agreements have uh, uh, debt to equity requirements or, you know, various covenants that are based on uh, debt equity debt to equity, uh, financial charge coverage, leverage ratios, minimum tangible net worth. And so you'll need to either make sure that once you uh, capitalize all your leases, you'll still meet those criteria, or uh, if you won't, then you need to get with your lender ahead of time so that you can get those uh, covenants uh, modified. Um, so, but on the other hand, uh, you know, rent is now interest and amortization. So that ends up being EBITDA add backs for uh, anybody for which that metric is uh, important. Uh, some other uh, business implications is, uh, you know, remember that on a financing lease, you're going to end up with more expense in the early years and uh, less expense in the later years, and that you're going to have to keep track of all these uh, leases. And, uh, you know, if you have a lot of leases, um, you may want to think about investing in some, some lease software. There's a number of uh, good packages out there, and your UHY professional can certainly help you with that uh, recommendation. Um, so that basically covers the uh, financial statement and accounting issues that I was planning on, on talking about. And now I'm going I'm to turn it over to John and he's going to tell you how to save a lot of money on taxes this year. 
Thanks, Bob. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is John Gallo, and I'm going to try to attempt to navigate you through the muck and the mire of the tax world in 2020 and 2021. So let's get started. So where are we? I pose that question because as of today, it's really hard to tell. Um, there's so many uncertainties yet to be clarified. Um, but what I do know is that it's really time to contact your trusted advisor, whether it's UHY or somebody else. I can't stress that enough. Right now is the perfect time to do e-tax planning. And you really need to set yourself up to, this is our plan, but we have alternate B. And if you need to and make a move quickly, you can do that. Um, so after this first slide, you all have the same feeling that Jim Helpert has here with his look. Like, hmm, what am I talking about? I have to say, I love that show. So I don't know if everybody knows, Jim's on the show called The Office. And he's a practical joker. And when I saw this episode of him putting his, his co-worker's um, stapler in the jello as an accountant, I've always wanted to find somebody at my office that I could take their 10 key and stick it in a bowl of jello. I haven't done it yet, but I sure want to. So let's continue. And let me explain what I meant by it's really hard to tell. The presidential race. Things are changing literally daily and hourly from probably, you know, this morning when I checked at 6.30 um, and what was going on. So, you know, as of today, Joe Biden does look like he's potentially uh, the new president, while Donald Trump continues to, to fight the election. And again, I think I saw that Georgia has been verified that Biden did win as my graph shows that it's still kind of up in the air. Um, but again, that's one of the issues. What administration is gonna be in the presidency? The second thing is the Senate. Um, I found this new tool and it's really cool and I'll probably be using it all presentation. Um, for the Senate race, there's still two seats that are highly contested, as you can see here. That's going to make a big difference. In addition, in the House of Representatives, while Republicans don't look like they're going to take the majority, they did make a lot of progress. And there's still some seats up in the air on that aspect as well. So, you know, unfortunately, I hate to talk politics, but if you're talking about tax policy, you really have to talk politics. Um, so, you know, if these are aligned and they end up being aligned and with a Democratic pet president and a Democratic Senate and a Democratic House of Representatives, a lot of tax policy will probably be implemented. Um, if not, you know, it might be a, a tougher road to get some of these things done. And that's why we just honestly do not know at this time. All right, it's tax time. Um, let's talk about some tax items for individuals. I did have this alarm going off. It was very obnoxious, so I saved it from the alarm. But I thought the cool shaking of it was, was kind of neat, so I left it in there. Um, let's start talking about tax. Here's the, for 2020, which is the year you're going to be starting to, you know, pull together and, and plan for, are the tax rates. And the only thing I really wanted you to take off of the screen is this 37% tax rate, which is the highest tax rate that individual pays. Um, that's really key and it's gonna come up later. In 2021, here are the new rates. And again, if nothing changes, highest tax rates 37%. Now, these individual amounts, these are the, the tax per bracket that you, in, um, that you pay. And the reason I included that was, you know, a lot of people have confusion and they say, if I make, you know, $200,000, what's my, what tax bracket am I in? So if you have $200,000, you're in this 24% bracket, but because of the earlier brackets and the, and the amount that you're paying out of each bracket, what you should be asking your tax preparer is, what's my effective tax rate? Your effective tax rate is this blended rate, and it's probably lower than that 24%. 
Um, some of the things that changed that really, you know, assisted a lot of taxpayers were was the increase in the standard deduction. And for 2020, it's 24,821. It's already set to be increased to 25,100. Um, you know, that was really a helpful. So, you know, a lot of the things people think um, Donald Trump's kind of, you know, exaggerating and um, and things that he he gets done, but this was really something that really made many many taxpayers their their preparation of their tax return significantly easier. So, Social Security. I like to show this graph because um, it has you know historical significance, and you can see the um, the wage base as it's increased over time. And what that means is after you pay in. Uh, your Social Security and you reach 144.21, it's increasing to 142.800. So that means that after you reach 142.800, Social Security stops. Maybe. We'll go over that in a little bit too. So remember that number, 142.8. Um, estate tax. Another thing that you know was changed in the Trump administration was it increased the amount of exemption for estate tax. Uh, where 2020, it's now 11 11 million 500 thousand, and in 21 it goes up to 11 million 700 thousand. So those levels are to be to sunset, and they'll phase out over time. Um, but in addition. You know, if Joe, if Biden gets in, and we'll see that in a bit, these could change drastically. So a tax tip is, you know, if you have this large estate, you might want to die before that number drops. What? Oh, strike that. Dying is not a good tax plan. That is not good tax planning. Something that is a tax planning tip um, is the gift tax exemption. So in 2020, a lot of people don't realize they can give up to $15,000 per individual tax-free. So if you're trying to reduce down your, your estate, um, you know where this is really becomes powerful is if you and your spouse, let's say have a daughter and that daughter's married, right? You and your spouse can give your daughter 15,000, so that's 30, but you can also give your son-in-law 15,000 each. So that's 60, so you can get rid of $60,000 out of your personal estate transfer it to your daughter with no tax implications. So that really gets powerful when you can adding up and it's per individual. So it's just something to keep in mind to, um, to make sure that we're, you know, you're keeping that in the back of your mind, reduced on your state, your estate um, without having to die. Uh, another tax planning tip that I wanted to bring to your attention for, for individual tax planning was rolling over or converting your 401k to a Roth. Uh, the Roth IRA conversion has gained a lot of interest recently because many individuals are expecting a large tax rate increase in the next year. So first the con, when you do a rollover from a 401k to a Roth, you have to pay the tax on the conversion on the amount that you're converting. Now that sometimes it's really not that bad. If you have NOLs or losses in your return, that can offset the gain that you're rolling over. So there's really a very minimal, if any, tax consequence. But in addition, you know, we're at historically low tax rates. Um, so, you know, if in your mind you believe tax rates are going up and they're gonna go up significantly, now might be a good time to consider this to take advantage of the low tax um, rates that we're in today. All right, let's talk about some business items. First, corporations. C corporations, uh, another thing that Donald Trump did was in, it instilled a flat corporate tax rate of 21%, historically very, very low. Um, Joe Biden clearly doesn't like that number thinks it's way too low. Um, but a lot of people, you know, really love it. And they're saying, well, wait a minute, if my top tax rate is 
maybe I should be switching my S Corp to a C Corp to take advantage of this 21% rate. So it's not always that easy. Um, by switching to a C Corp, you may have state tax implications that you're not considering that you'd have to pay. Uh, in Michigan, uh, our corporate tax rate for, the, for a corporation is 6%, whereas for a flow-through entity such as an S Corp, it has no tax. So those are things you have to consider. In addition though, how, lo how long will that 21% um, stay around, especially with the new administration coming in? That's one of those let's see situations that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so I love this one aspect. Uh, people in the construction industry we love our yellow toys, don't we? Um, they, you know, contractors just can't can't buy enough equipment. I got I got to need need the new bulldozer. I need the new backhoe or whatever it is. Um, they love it. You know, they get so excited. And a lot of my contractors don't know one tax code. F they couldn't recite a tax code if it saved their soul. But they do know the section 179. That is the one thing that they do know because they know that they get a deduction for all the equipment they get to purchase. So in 2020, uh, you know, the, the max amount you can take for 179 is a million 40. In 21, it goes up to a million 50. Now they also have um, the availability to take bonus depreciation. So bonus depreciation is you can write off 100% of newer used equipment immediately. So a lot of people say, well, you know, well, that's an easy answer. I wouldn't even have to worry about what these limitations are for 179. I'll just write off everything under bonus. The difference is many states don't uh, recognize the bonus depreciation method. So when you go to do your state return, any bonus depreciation has to get added back. And then you have to recalculate your depreciation for that state. And that can, that can really kind of trip you up if you plan on taking this bonus depreciation. So if you take what section 179, and you're not above this limitation. Section 179, because it's historically been in place in, in, in the tax code, code um, is accepted by the IRS, but it's also accepted by most states. Um, net operating losses. So nobody likes to be in a position to have a net operating loss, clearly. But because of the current situations, you may find yourself in, an op in a situation where your S corporation has an operating loss. You have a net operating loss in your return. Um, some of the changes that they made and concessions that they made uh, in the recent tax law has limited to the use of, of net operating losses to 80%. However, you can carry those forward indefinitely. Um, the new CARES Act that Bob had mentioned earlier actually changed those rules because they know people are hurting and they want to generate cash flow. So they've changed some of the rules to carry back, you can carry back five years to various years. We're not here to learn about the tax law and so you know that the NOL rules. The takeaway from this is that you get with your tax advisor and say, hey, do I have NOLs and do I have tax that I paid in previous years that we can go get? to generate cash flow for my business. That's what you got to make sure that you're not leaving anything on the table in the next year after things expire. Because once they expire, you can't go back and get them. So mark that down. Do I have NOLs? Can we go back and free up prior tax dollars to increase my cash flow? Uh, a couple more tax planning tips. You know, um, Many taxpayers believe there's this silver bullet, right? There's one tax item, and if we implement that, you're gonna owe no tax, all your tax goes away, it's a great day. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. So tax planning is really setting up your business to take most advantage of as many tax items as you possibly can. And a lot of times that means, you know, you might be looking at some tax credits, and these aren't gonna be hundreds of thousands of dollars, but there might be $10,000, $20,000. And, you know, by looking at these credits, I really, I equate tax planning to, you know, playing a baseball game, right? You get a single, 
Then you get another single and you score a run. You get another double and you score a run. So it's a hit and a hit and another hit. And these add up. And those add up to, to, to dollars, to tax dollars that you save. So don't disregard them because they're, they might be small credits. Um, these ones specifically, I think, I think all businesses should be looking at, which are you know, the research credit, uh, a new market credit, and a retirement plan credit. So reach out to your advisor and make sure you know, they're looking at that for you and say, hey, have you ever looked at some of these credits? I know there's a lot of them out there. And we consider them for my business. Do I, do I qualify for those? So the general rule is defer, defer, defer. Why pay a tax dollar today when you can potentially kick it down the road and who knows what's gonna change, right? So we're always about defer, deferring. Well, currently we're in a situation where potentially we know for a fact that tax rates are gonna be going up. So in this kind of situation, you really have to kind of rethink it and say, I know I'm gonna pay a tax. I know I'm gonna have this income obligation um, which is going to generate some tax obligations. Maybe you accelerate that and you actually pick it up to this year to pay it at these lower rates. So if you're going to pay some kind of tax dollars, you'd rather pay it at a lower rate than a higher rate. It's really a unique situation. It's typically not what we think, um, but you know today's a, not a typical year for sure, especially for tax planning. We wish tax planning was that easy, don't we? Um, you know, I, I had a uh, an older gentleman that had substantial amount of income from various different sources. So he gave me all all his information. You know, we we took our time, prepared his uh, you know his, a very accurate return for him. I gave him his bill, and he said, "John, how can my bill be this high? I know what you guys do. You put a bunch of numbers in a computer and you press a button, and that's what that provides me of." Oh yeah, that's all we do is we put numbers into a, uh, into a computer, press a button, and then there's your tax. So clearly tax planning um, is very valuable um, and it's really not that easy. We wish it was that easy. So can we take a second and take a look at who the people of our great country came up with as our two options to run this country? Yep, I mean, that's all I have to say about that slide. So going back to the very beginning, it does look like Biden might be, um, you know, the next president. And like we discussed, depending on what happens in the Senate and the House, he may be able to push a lot of his policies through, um, or he might not. But let's, let's review some of those policies, um, because potentially those could impact, you know, everybody. The first one's the tax rate. And remember, I, I identified the top tax rate right now is 37%. Well, Joe Biden is proposing a top tax rate of 39.6 if your income is over 400,000. So, you know, 400,000 is a very healthy income, absolutely. But is that really the uber rich? I don't really know. Um, you know, itemized deductions, so under the current tax law, there's some limitations on medical, there's some little limitations on state taxes, but at the end of the day, your itemized deductions, there's no limitation. Whatever that bottom line number is, you're allowed to deduct those as your itemized deductions. In Joe Biden's plan, he wants to limit those itemized deductions to make sure that you're paying an income tax at a rate of 28%. So no matter how many itemized deductions you have, it can't knock your income down, so you're paying less than a 28% rate. So I'm sure everybody remembers AMT. Sure sounds like AMT to me, just in a different format to get it done. And the corporate tax rate, he has clearly attacked the corporate tax rate being so low at 21%. So again, my humble opinion, uh, one of the first things Joe Biden would go after would be to raise that corporate tax rate. And he's talked about raising it to 28% or even higher. So going back to the, the original slide, if you're thinking, yeah, let's just you know switch my, my corporation to a C Corp to get this low rate, probably not gonna be in existence very much longer. Um, Social Security, 
Again, if you remember the Social Security slide, I said, remember that one key number, 142,000. So Joe Biden would like to, everyone pays up to the 142, but then if you're over 400,000 again, he wants the, the Social Security to kick in again and you need to repay. So if you haven't paid your fair share, he wants you to kick in and pay even more. And that's really for both an individual will pay the 6.2% and then the, your, the company who pays your payroll will pay 6.2 for a total of 12.4. Um, capital gains. So currently capital gains, depending on where your income falls, could be between 15 and 20%. 20% is a very attractive rate. Uh, it really incentivizes um, investment and capital gains. So Joe, Boy Joe Biden wants to take, you know, the if you have capital gains and dividends and you have over a million dollars of income, he wants to tax those at 39.6%. That is obviously effectively doubling the tax rate on those capital gains. Um, so, you know, somebody who makes a million dollars and has significant capital gains and dividends they're not paying their 20% tax rate and sticking the rest of the cash under their mattress. What they do is they'll take that gain, pay the tax, and then reinvest it. And by reinvesting it, they're putting it back into companies, which then the company to increase needs to hire employees, thereby people get employed and they get jobs and then they earn wages and that keeps the economy running. So, you know, he thinks he's raising money where potentially you could be hindering the economy by not incentivizing people to continue to invest in the economy. Um, it, it could be a dangerous slope, slope to take. Some of these, these are some other items that are changed, Biden proposed changes. The one I wanted to talk about was the one at the bottom here. And I, honest to goodness, I have to believe that when they all get into the room to come up with a tax agenda, the, the one third of the time is spent coming up with what do we call this tax? So this tax is called the GILTI. Literally, the acronym is G-I-L-T-I. It's Global Intangible Low Tax Income. And you know they made that fit so that they could call it the GILTI tax. We're not going to go into the guilty tax. It's very complex. It has to do with investing in foreign corporations outside the United States. Right now, the tax rate is 10.5%. Joe Biden wants to take that to 21%, effectively doubling it. Um, but it just it just kills me because they come up with these ridiculous names for these for these um, tax laws. So I wanted to touch on the, the Paycheck Protection Program um, from a tax aspect because, you know, Bob did a great job covering it for financial statement purposes. But this year, this was such a big year. Throughout the summer, that's all I did was talk to my clients uh, and we talked about the PPP loan and how do we get the PPP loan. And once we had the PPP loan, how do we properly spend it? And now we're in a situation to say, Okay, now that we spent the money, it's time to submit our loan application. How do we do that properly to make sure that it gets forgiven? So it really was, you know, um, you know how they have this, the song of the summer that everybody sings, you can't get it out of your head, and everybody. This this was this was the the tax item of the summer of 2020 for sure. Um, so I'm gonna boy, I'm not a I'm not a, a test guy, a financial statement guy by any means. So I'm gonna boil it down to Everything Bob said, when I took it into my brain, I heard there's two models on how to treat PPP loans, the debt model and the grant model. The debt model means you treat it as a loan and you put it on your balance sheet until it's actually forgiven. It's debt, which hence in the name, which I, I guess I didn't add, but it's the Paycheck Protection Program uh, loan program. So it, it, it is, you know, to be treated as a loan until it is forgiven. Makes sense. Um, as Bob had mentioned, there's also the second model, which is the grant model. And that model says you don't keep it on your balance sheet. You actually have the ability to record it in your income statement. The reason I bring that up 
is from a tax perspective, you need to know what was done in your balance sheet uh, from a book perspective and a financial statement perspective to know how to treat it on the tax side of things. So again, things are changing so drastically. Um, just two days ago, the IRS released Rev Ruling 2020-51. Um, so a while back, they issued Rev Ruling 2020-27, and which said for the PPP loan money, you can't deduct the expenses until the actual loan is forgiven. So it's kind of that matching principle that Bob was talking about. So the expenses are non-deductible. So you have, to, you have to take those expenses out of your income statement. In effect, you're increasing your taxable income and you're basically paying the tax on that loan. What they just came out with was 2020-51, which says you must attach a statement to your tax return that says, I want to elect the safe harbor option. And what that does is says, I'm going to add back my expenses. And then after this year, after 12-31-20, when it's determined if the loan is forgiven or I have to pay it back, then you have the option of A, or number one, amending your 2020 return, and then you can pick up those expenses. So let's say the, the, you chose to treat it as a debt, you left it on your books, you had to add back the expenses, 2021 rolls around, and for whatever reason, they say, your loan's not forgiven, you have to pay it back. Well, in that situation, you have the option to say, I wanna go back and amend and take my expenses that I didn't take in the 2020 tax year, or you can actually take them in 2021 in the subsequent tax year when it's forgiven, which would be in 2021. So you have that option, but to do that, you have to make sure you include a statement with your timely filed tax return. So this is the part of the program where it makes me feel like Oprah. Have you ever watched Oprah back in the day? You get a planning guide, you get a planning guide, you get a planning guide, everybody gets a planning guide. So, you know, on the Oprah show, people were getting, you know, subcontract, sub um, you know, cars. We're not handing out cars today, but everybody here who's attended, it's, it's on our session, is going to have access to our 2020 tax planning guide. And I wanted just to give you a brief overview of it. Here it is. I'm not taking credit. I didn't put anything part of this together, um, but I but I do think my my um, my coworkers at UHY did a phenomenal job on this planning guide. It's really exceptional, and this is how you use it. So across the top, you have topics, and let's say you're looking at uh, the retirement topic, and you said, man, you know that Gallo guy, he was talking about um, Roth options, and Roth converting a, to a Roth IRA. You click on the Roth option, and it gives you a little bit of a background just to give you a flavor. So we're not saying you need to become the tax expert because you read a couple paragraphs, but it gives you enough to kind of give you a, a feel for the topic. That's step one. Step two is to pick up the phone and call your UHY advisor and start a conversation. That's the key. This is just to kind of give you a familiarity with it, but you need to communicate, we need to be talking, and we need, we need to really do that planning. That planning starts today. Um, that should be number one on your priority list. So this is really great. We're gonna send out this link to everybody. You're gonna have this link that you just click on. You'll have access to all this great tax planning information. Um, just to kind of give you a background. That's not the, that's, the, that's just step one of the tax planning process. Step two is talking with your advisor. So if you're asking yourself, hmm, I don't know, who's my UHY advisor? It's this guy. Just kidding. Anybody at UHY can help you. Um, please reach out. We're all here to help. Um, 
and and you know good luck on 2020 good luck on 2021 let's all be safe um and i want to thank you for your time susan Great. back Great. to you thanks john we let's we just have a minute or two to get to some questions that were submitted so we have one question relating uh, to financial statements, Bob. So uh, the question is, why can't debt forgiveness under the debt model be addressed as a subsequent event, um, especially when the expenses giving rise to the forgiveness are recorded in that prior year? So it seems like a mismatch. And it is, uh, Susan, uh, but uh, one, one thing ab about accounting is that uh, everybody that I took accounting a long time ago learned this concept called the matching principle and uh, it's actually not an accounting principle that's currently in the guidance matching is is not a requirement um, so you have to look at uh, whether that's a type one or a type two subsequent event and as we, we talked about in the, the one slide the forgiveness uh, itself is a type two subsequent event. It provides uh, information about what was on the books of the balance sheet, but it would need to be a type one subsequent event. Uh, the event must have occurred as of the balance sheet date in order for you to get forgiveness. That's really just the way the debt forgiveness provisions of the uh, code work. Okay, so what are you seeing? How long of a wait do you think people have? Have you started to see loans be forgiven? And um, do we have to wait for, is it the bank forgiving it? Is it SBA, is it both? So uh, my experience uh, so far has been that uh, companies with smaller loans are actually seeing uh, forgiveness really fairly quickly. Uh, I have a couple of instances where, uh, you know, they've filed the applications and uh, Receive notification from the SBA within around 30 days that their loan has been forgiven. Um, I've not seen anybody have to go through the audit uh, provisions yet, and so I'm interested in seeing how long that would take. I, I don't really have any uh, thought on that. <clears throat> okay, great. And John, since you know we're, we're everything is about the PPP loan right now, and we're at the end of November, the IRS or the Treasury just issued that statement. Do do we have any hope of them turning this around? I mean, we're past the election. Any chance at all by the end of the year or even into January, since I know they like to pass things after year end affecting it, that uh, employers will be able to deduct those uh, payroll expenses? Yeah, so, um, you know, my, my, my thought is clearly nothing was going to get done until this election is clearly over. Everything was put on, you know, a standstill or a halt. Nobody, nobody wanted to work with anybody else. So, you know, what, once a president has been definitively um, decided, uh, there could something could happen. And you know, if they really wanted to, they can get something done quickly. We've seen it happen before at the eleventh hour, and then you know, all the politicians and the the congressmen tout how they work till three in the morning to get this done for the for the taxpayers of the country it, it could happen um you know just from my personal thought um you know you can see that, that joe biden is looking to raise taxes I, he, he's made it clear we have to raise taxes we have to get, generate more revenue so what's their incentive to release it and not generate this tax because you know by by saying it's a taxable event um you know, $100 of tax, they're going to recoup 30 cents of that, more or less, in, in, in taxes. And yet, the taxpayer still gets 70%, which is which is free to them. So it's really not that bad of a, of a deal when you look at it that way. I just don't see a lot of incentive for them, you know, reversing it at this at this time. Yeah. So we'll, we'll plan for the worst, but maybe still hope for the best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, well, thank you, John and Bob, for this great information. Thank you, everyone, our guests, for spending a little bit of time with us today. If you have a specific question or topic that you would like to discuss with John or Bob, please be sure to reach out to them. Uh, John, you want to flip the contact information up, yep. and um, they would be happy to help. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Have a great weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.